hello everyone I think this is up I think it's working and I think it's live so I'll just wait for two more secs to wait for the little wheel to go around and there we go it looks like that we are live so hello everyone it's so cool to be back in this Facebook group again and to be chatting to you I felt um, like it was so rushed last time and we didn't get a really good chance to speak to each other. So here we are and I'm really looking forward to the next hour that I get to share with you. Now a few housekeeping things. You will notice that I'll be looking directly at you but also looking off to the side. So I have put up a new camera just because um, the last time my camera didn't look like a very great quality for our lives. So I've got a camera up but I've also got the computer off to the side and also um, I don't normally do lives with notes. It's really rare for me. I'm normally um, either being interviewed by someone else or um, I just love sort of talking off the cuff about everything that's important and when it comes to gut health so um, you know excuse me if I'm referring to my notes but I just don't want to miss out on anybody's questions and I want to make sure that we get through everything so now we've got all of that out the way hey Rhonda how are you going it's so good to see you and it looks like we're all ready to go and everything is working fine so let's jump into it let's get into this first question now Kendra said concerning the fiber foods, grains, starchy vegetables, just wondering if there is a healthy upper limit to these foods to consume in a day if I want to cycle out of ketosis. So this is a great question. So I love the benefit of being in ketosis. It is incredible for ramping up your body's ability to do a bit of cellular cleanup, support your metabolism, support brain function. And it overall, it just gives you that clarity of mind, that incredible cognitive function. It also helps us when we're coming back from gut dysbiosis or chronic disease. You know, we have all of our clients jump into ketosis because of those benefits. Now, when you're in ketosis, you keep your vegetables and your carbohydrates quite low. Now, a lot of people think that means that you have to cut out all those beautiful vegetables, starchy carbs, all those sorts of things, but you can ferment them. Now, I, t I know we talked about this last time, but I really want to reiterate that you can ferment these carbs, these beautiful um, vegetables, you can ferment carrots, you can ferment all sorts of things. And that will basically get rid of the carb content, the sugar content, and it'll just leave you with those beautiful probiotics, which means that you can stay in, in ketosis, but you can get the benefits of the probiotics and all the fiber and all of the beautiful nutrients from that food. So yes, if you're wanting to stay in ketosis, but you wanna up your fiber game, just ferment. Absolutely, it's, all, it's the number one thing that you need to do. Okay, so Claire has a question about hormones here. Hey, Belinda, lovely to see you. Now, her question is, once we start increasing our fiber intake, how soon after we start would we see benefits in regards to hormone regulation and easing of symptoms? Now, Claire, that's the million dollar question, as you can imagine, and it's gonna be different for every single person. And our beautiful bodies, um, female bodies, our hormones work in a cycle. So for some people, it's about three cycles or about three months that we really start to see those gains and benefits. But I know that many of our clients and many people we've worked with, it's been within that first month. So, you know, they've had a cycle, had a bleed, and then by the time the next one comes around, I, you know, I hear literally hear some women say, I. I didn't even realize it was coming. I didn't have that pain and cramping. I didn't have all those symptoms, the swollen breasts, the anxiety, the everyone, move out, leave the house, I'm, I'm cranky, I can't cope, you know, stay away from mum kind of stuff. And you know, I've heard many, many women say that they notice it from one cycle to the next. So of course, Claire, it's dependent on how long that chronic situation has been happening for, your age, what's going on with your hormones, have you had children, all of those sorts of things. But it's a relatively short amount of time that we start to see some awesome changes, which is so encouraging when you embark on um, making a change and doing something different. 
Alrighty, hey Karen, hey Lainey, you're there, hello, it's good to see you. Um, I've got everyone else, and Kylie's on, hello Kylie. Beautiful. So of course, let's get into stools, it didn't take me long, we've gone from just general fiber questions to hormones and here we are with our stools. Okay, so Lisa has a question here. Um, she'd say that she goes between a four and a six. Now, of course, this is when we're talking about the Bristol stool chart and make and how we track what's going on with our stools. Does color matter? Um, at the minute, gas seems to be my biggest issue and that is so painful. I get a feeling SIBO might be something I should look into, likely my kids as well. I'm also pretty sure low progesterone is a problem for me, but since I had a, a section three weeks ago, wow, Lisa, you got a lot going on. I should probably wait until my hormones are settled down before I look at things further. Yes, absolutely wait till things settle down. But let's go back to that question of color of your stool. Now your ideal stool color is a beautiful brown stool. And that brown, you know, has been, the color of it literally has started and has been created well upstream with the action of your gallbladder. Shooting in that bile, and emulsifying those fats, and your gallbladder has a lot to do with that. So we're, we're thinking about the liver, we're thinking about the gallbladder when we think about the color of our stools, which is often not the connection that we would make. Now, if your stool is yellow, if your stool is green, if your stool is white, if your stool is even a light brown, then this is gonna indicate lots of inflammation. This is gonna indicate that there is a dysbiosis, there is an upstream effect going on. And like I said, issues with pancreas, which help us make our digestive enzymes, and also the gallbladder, which helps us with that bile that we need. So if it's very dark or black, you should absolutely see a doctor because you want to rule out if there's any blood in your stools, if it's gone that blackish color. And when I hear someone say, I think it's a SIBO picture, you want to test, don't guess. It's really important. We don't want to have like, I think I've got low progesterone, I think I've got SIBO, um, you know, and, and sort of thinking we've got these things. Let's just test it, you know, get over to culture wellness, get those tests done and make sure that we know exactly what we're dealing with because the path to getting better is so much quicker when we know what we're dealing with. Okay, oh, sorry about that very loud noise. Now, Leanne has a question about div, um, div, <laughs> oh, divectolysis. I cannot say this. Now, she's talking about um, chia seeds and would, if you're consuming it, be okay. Now, if you have those pockets in your bowel, it's going to be very, very hard to have chia seeds because they'll, of course, be hard to eat and they will get stuck in those, po those pockets. So, you know, if you've got very chronic situation like that going on, you absolutely want to see a practitioner. So come and see a culture wellness practitioner and work on your gut, work on that inflammation and work on the digestive system as a whole. And remembering that our digestive system literally starts in our brain and goes all the way through to the exit. So we want to make sure that we're looking at all of it. But yes, absolutely. Um, chia seeds will cause inflammation. Any for to f form of fiber when you've got gut issues will cause inflammation. So it's very important to fix that and get that sorted out. Okay, Susan's got a question here. I have a mixed, uh, I am mixed with her bowel movements. Starts off at around a three, but finishes around a six. Um, have always wondered about that. So, you know, that's really interesting. We see this a lot where someone might be constipated, they're struggling to push out their stool with a daily motion. And then once, the, once it sort of starts, then there's this big rush on at the end and it can end up being a lot of diarrhea or vice versa. It can start off as diarrhea and end up as stools, but it's normally the other way around. Now, this is the case that it could be that your stools are moving too fast. So that transit time that we've been talking about. So the stool is moving too fast and it hasn't had time to absorb all of that fluid in the colon. So we want that to happen. 
We want our stools to bulk up with the fiber, bulk up with that fluid so it's easy to pass, it's been bulked out. So if you've got that picture of, um, you know, that sort of rushing at the end, the diarrhea at the end, then it's very likely there could be some inflammation going on and it's definitely worth getting that tested. So once again, um, if that has been a normal thing for you, it doesn't mean that that's um, how it should be. It's definitely something worth investigating. I'm going to have a little drink. All right. I went on the most massive mountain bike ride this morning and my heart goes out to all of you in Victoria. If there's anyone here online that's from Victoria, please give me a shout out, give me a wave, say hello. I actually was riding this morning, I'm training for a mountain bike race, it's called the Epic, um, it's a 50 kilometer single track mountain bike race. And um, as we were out there, we trained for sort of two and a half, three hours this morning. As we were out there training, we actually, my training partner and I actually stopped and had a little bit of, a bit of um, moment of silence to think about everyone in Victoria. We feel so blessed to be able to go out and about and to be able to exercise and train. And so we were thinking of all our beautiful, beautiful Victorians. Um, and so I'm going to have to drink a lot because I'm very dehydrated <laughs> from um, doing this huge race this morning. So bear with me while I have my drinks. I've actually got some um, broth in here. So I'm hydrating with bone broth and I've put a whole heap of extra Himalayan salt in there to make sure that I can get lots of extra electrolytes going on. So And lots of magnesium as well. Alrighty. So... Um, Oh, there's lots more questions here. Okay, well, let me get through. Oh, there's Carolyn, there you are. Trish, you're there. Claire, Angela. Oh, guys, I'm thinking of you all. And and just know that when there are people all over Australia that when we're out and about doing things, we're thinking of you. Okay, now, Louise has said here, I have SIBO. Now, SIBO is a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So what that means is there is a bacteria in the small intestine that has completely gone crazy. It's completely overrun that small intestine and is causing a dysbiosis. And it can cause all sorts of horrible, horrible symptoms. It can be bloating, it can be gas, it can be you know, undigested food, it can be really chronic autoimmune conditions, a lot of pain, a lot of headaches, a lot of malnutrition, so um, vitamin nutrient deficiencies, and it's horrible. And so for Louise, she's talking about, just wondering about thoughts on fiber and SIBO treatment. Sometimes we, um, for, you know, if we're treating someone with SIBO, which is very common, we see it all the time, sometimes we do actually have to reduce the fiber, and we certainly reduce the fiber that has any sugars in it. So. For example, we've reduced um, any fibers that have fructose sugars in it, so carrots, for example, and we'd reduce the fibers that have even glucose sugars in there because those sugars will feed the bacteria, in the bacterial infection that's in the small intestine that's causing all the problems. So we, we want to absolutely stop that. So once again, fermenting is very important in that picture, and also, we swap to a diet um, for getting that back on track, so getting rid of that dysbiosis. We swap to a diet that is really easy to digest, really easy on the body to be able to simulate those nutrients. And we really focus on fat as that fuel source so it doesn't you know, get um, any of the glucose, the fructose, any of those sugars that will fire up and feed that bacterial infection. Okay, so um, we do bring down the fiber while we're treating the condition and we always aim to get back to a diversity of fiber. But once again, really important to test to see if you've got SIBO as opposed to, you know, I think I've got the symptoms, I think I've got SIBO. Um, and, you know, we do the uh, microbial mapping test, the um, GI microbial mapping test to have a look at that SIBO picture. Okay, so just checking. 
Oh, Lainey, I cannot pronounce <laughs> diverticulitis. I really have to struggle. I really struggle with that one. Okay, so here's another question um, from an anon anonymous person who is a middle-aged and more mature woman. I love that. So I often need to manually assist my stools to evacuate. Um, I could be sitting on the toilet for ages, which is not fair. And it... Um, it in turn pushes and she gets that through. Is this a structural issue? Because once it's manually assisted, the stool will come out. Is this a structural issue or something that I should look at improving diet through? So constipation, yes, is an absolutely, for some people, it's a lifelong condition. We see it with people that have had it just for their whole life. And once again, have normalized it. And there are some really cluey people out there who have managed to work out how to fix it, some hacks, some tricks to make things work, but it doesn't mean that that's how it should be. So yes, you would absolutely want to test what's going on with your gut microbiome because you should be able to have a beautiful, effortless evacuation and you shouldn't have to manually um, trigger that evacuation, it should happen effort effortlessly, and you want to make sure that you understand the reason why. Now, even going up right up to the top of the small intestine, for example, where um, you know we need a robust amount of serotonin to help with that peristilic action to push everything through so it can keep going. We want to have that migrating motor which helps us to migrate, obviously, as it says, all of that beautiful food and that stool to come down. And then in the bowel, we wanna have all of the appropriate microbes, the right hydration, the right fiber, and the right pH to be able to push that stool out effortlessly. So yes, sometimes it can be a structural issue. So you might wanna, uh, we definitely want to invest and look at a squatty potty that brings your knees up, so it gives you much better posture when you're going to the toilet, um, which is much, much better for evacuation. So that will help. But yes, you want to look at your diet. You want to look at, is there any dysbiosis in there? What's going on? Because we shouldn't need to manually help us to evacuate our stools. So yes, absolutely. Um, make sure that we look at that. And getting that fiber in, that prebiotic foods, all of those things are very, very important. Okay, now this is a really good one because we see um, things like this all the time. So a 71-year-old anonymous person has had a tummy upset two years ago from a bad omelet. Oh, that would be that I don't want to ever eat eggs again kind of situation. But the gut has never been the same since. Anything out of the ordinary now seems to upset. So lots of loud gurgling, gas, diarrhea, and I eat mostly whole foods and can't identify what's upsetting it. Okay, so this is such a great um, you know, example of why it's so important to get a test. So there was obviously something going on with that omelet or possibly some water that you drank or you might have had some lettuce with the omelet or some food that had a parasite or a bacteria on there and you absolutely want to get that tested. So, um, you know, if you have had a stool test and, oh yes, and it showed a parasite called defragilis, so that's what's happened and apparently only usually present in children Doctor didn't seem concerned and took it no further. Now, um, we see defragilis in adults and children, so it's absolutely representative of any age group. We see defragilis everywhere. It's a parasite, and it, if it has an opportunity to take over the space where it lives, so in the gut, it can cause exactly all of those things, the loud gurgling, the gas, the diarrhea, the cramping, anxiety, really poor sleep, grinding of your teeth. It can, um, you know, when people get ringing in their ears, like they're all classic, classic symptoms of that defragilis. And yeah, you wanna absolutely do all the right things to make a change to that because every time you eat some sugar or glucose or carbohydrates or anything, even if it's whole foods, anything that's going to flare that up, 
then you're going to have an adverse reaction. And it, like it could be literally for some people just having some avocado or having a banana or having some beautiful berries. That's enough. When this defragilius parasite has taken over the space, that's enough to cause problems. So um, yes, make sure that you make those changes. And if you've got that um, pathogen, I'd highly recommend that you do a parasite cleanse. And so that's obviously, um, we have parasite cleanses at Cultured Wellness. So they're beautiful medicinal herbs that you would use in conjunction with a diet that nourishes you, but doesn't nourish and feed the parasite that's uh, causing the problem. So yeah, you wanna make sure that you're getting to the bottom of that. And we find if it's long-term, like if that one was two years, then herbals are a great way to go there. Okay, now um, I'm often constipated after sitting on the toilet for a while. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> sitting on the toilet for a while. Um, realize nothing's going to happen, so I just go about my day and later on I evacuate. Um, and that's fine and it's a nice three or four. So does that mean my stools just need <coughs> more time to cook? I love that. Even though it feels like they're ready or is it just constipation? So, <coughs> excuse me. This could be an example of slow transit time. So um, for the person that asked this question, I highly recommend you go back and do the, <coughs> the sesame seed challenge that um, Lainey so awesomely did and explained. So go back and do the sesame seed challenge see how long it takes for the sesame seeds to come through and how long it takes to eliminate. So it could be an elimination thing. It could be that the bowel's not hydrated, so once again, more fluids. Um, otherwise, our bowel has these big contractions only about two to three times a day to be able to get out and to eliminate. So, um, you know, if you miss the boat first thing in the morning, then you will have another opportunity later on and that's perfectly fine. So, and um, interestingly, as I've got in the notes here, bowels love habit. They absolutely love habit as our bodies do. So if you've got a habit now that you don't eliminate until later on in the day, that's perfectly fine. If you want to get into a habit of eliminating in the morning more, then you might uh, look at some more magnesium the night before just to assist with that. Um, getting some more hydration in in the mornings to assist with that. But if that's your thing, if that's your habit, then you don't need to change that. That's fine. Unless you're out somewhere when the elimination happens and it's not really helping you. Alrighty. Now, there was a lot of questions, and I won't go into it too much here because I know that Kylie's been answering these questions on the um, Facebook page, but there's been a lot of questions about um, supplements. So um, what do you think about you know, oxy powders and K-fibers and all those sorts of things? And really, um, I, like my absolute 100% you know, recommendation is just stick to companies like the Whole Food Collective and stick to just natural supplements and, nat sorry, just stick to natural foods. So we can get pretty excited about fibers and we can get pretty excited about powders, we can get very excited about supplements, but the aim is to always use whole foods and the aim is to get our digestion up to this rocking set point and we don't wanna be relying on these powders, we don't wanna be relying on these supplements and so, and we, you know, it saves you money. You're cooking with whole foods. Um, when you're relying on powders and supplements, um, they're not in the complete form that your body best utilizes. So um, yeah, make sure that you're looking at the nutrient dense and good fibers and the mixes that Lainey does at Whole Food Collective. Um, their products are beautiful and you will be getting everything that you need. I know Lainey's very, very keen on making sure that the nutrition profiles there. It's got the right fibers. It's got everything that it needs. She's done all the hard work for you. So don't, you know, don't worry about that. Okay, so, you know, she's got all of her fiber boost blend. She's got everything to create that diversity. So they're organic, they're spray free. They're everything that you want. So I don't think you need 
powders as such or supplements. You can get it from whole foods and, you know, things like fermenting and using your cultures to ferment, those sorts of things. Okay, um, I know gelatin and bone broth are great for our bodies, but I'm vegan. So how do I get the benefits without it coming from an animal? And P.S. I only turned vegan because I had so much gut problems. <laughs> um, it has worked mostly except for still not regularly um, doing, you know, number two stool. So I'm not against these two ingredients if they can be sourced ethically and benefits outweigh not having them. So I love, um, Dina, I love that you've said here about it being ethically sourced and grass fed and all of the things that are so important when it comes to consuming bone broth, making bone broth, you know, get to know your butcher or if you're going to purchase bone broth um, in a powder form, make sure you know the companies that you're using. We love Broth of Life because we know that all of their bones are organic, they're grass fed. They, we know exactly how the cattle are treated because that company is so particular about those things. But um, there's, there's a lot going on in this question. And, um, you know, when you're talking about um, can you get the benefits from a vegan option with regards to bone broths, I, I really don't think you can. So, um, you know, bone broth has all of those amazing amino acids like glycine, like proline. It's got lysine in it. It's got all sorts of incredible amino acids in there that you can't get in that readily available source in a vegan supplement. So it is quite difficult to do that. So and we know that glycine and proline, you know, plugs up the holes in your gut, supports liver function. You know, um, lysine, for example, I've been taking huge doses of that lately. It's so important for um, supporting your body with regards to making sure that we have all of the things on board to protect us against viruses. So we want to make sure that we're getting all those amino acids. So, um, you know, but a good source of gut repairing food, like we do for the bone broth, is aloe vera, slippery elm. And we use those things, you know, a lot when we, our clients go through our gut healing programs. We want foods that have got a lot of mucilage in them. So we want, you know, flax and chia, those sorts of things that can support evacuation, support our gut. But, you know, as I said before, gelatin and bone broth, they are just so deeply nourishing and they're very, very, you know, rich for the body, for supporting our, um, you know, our cellular repair. So I, that's a really tricky one for me to answer. Very, very tricky. But there are a few options in there, are a few. Okay. There are so many questions there. So Kylie, I think, is going to be trying to answer some questions in here while I get through these. And hopefully I'll be able to get back to all these beautiful questions that you've got coming up. And it's really lovely to see you all on here. It's so awesome that you're all so keen to learn so much about gut health and fiber. Okay, let's go to the next one. So water intake. Is the goal to have perfectly clear urine? And Absolutely not. We don't want to have perfectly clear urine because we don't want to over dilute and lose electrolytes. So um, interestingly, you know, we have this whole got to have three and four liters of water a day. I've got to, you know, hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. But you've got to go back to, I don't know, biology in year 10, 101. We've got to think about you know, what actually hydrates our body? What hydrates our cells? What does our body need? And, you know, it's sodium bicarbonate and it's magnesium and it's potassium. You know, these are the things that are going to hydrate our bodies, not chlorinated water from the tap. And certainly just even if it's not, you know, um, chlorinated water from the tap, we want to make sure we're adding in those beautiful nutrients and those electrolytes and we aren't aiming for perfect, clear urine. So, um, as you know, I'll talk about probably further down, but if you're getting filtered, mineralized water and using like a filter like Zazen, for example, is so wonderful because it's gonna mineralize your water and then you can add, if you need to, some electrolytes in there. You know, just even a squeeze of lemon, some sea salt in there, um, Himalayan salt, that's going to give you all those beautiful electrolytes. 
I often in my water will put a dash of apple cider vinegar in there for a huge hit of potassium. Um, you know, so today when I went on my mountain bike ride, I had all sorts of <laughs> all sorts of things to keep me going on my ride. But I always put about a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar in my big main water bottle just to keep that potassium going. Okay, and now Angela has a great question about does the water and ice in a supercharged smoothie count towards our eight glasses of water a day and because um, it takes her about two hours to finish her smoothie so yes absolutely that will um, contribute to it but it will also contribute to all those beautiful nutrients as well okay now Karen's got a great question here about does your body maintain better hydration if you up your water to intake significantly for a prolonged period of time i.e. If I'm drinking three to four liters a day and increase my fiber intake to 30 grams, will I still need to maintain this once I achieve the three to four on the Bristol stool chart, that iconic three to four? Um, now, this is, this is really interesting because when we're making these wonderful changes, we just want to make them our everyday changes and we want, to, sorry, we want to make them our changes that are just our everyday and they're our consistent new pattern and our new way of doing things. So we, yes, we want to get that good hydration from that mineral rich water and we want to hydrate um, our body to make sure that our cells get that function and we want to be doing it all the time. So we don't just um, get, you know, that massive hydration, we don't then make sure we get our fiber and then think that once we've got there, we're magically going to keep it at a three or a four in our stools. As soon as we drop off and we stop hydrating that much or we stop the fiber, then it will change. So it is, it's a beautiful consistent thing that you need to keep up all the time. But once again, make sure that you're getting that beautiful um, mineralized water. Okay. Okay, here we go. This is a great question by Lisa. This is actually a really good one. And the reason why, um, I'll get to in a minute. So, is it better to try to consistently sip on water throughout the day, or is it equally beneficial to glug down huge amounts of water at you know set points in time during the day? Um, I suspect it's better to sip, but it seems impossible um, with my lot who drink when they're thirsty. Okay, so here's a couple of things about water and um, our digestion. So once again, as we go back to when we were talking in our first slide, your gut, sorry, your um, stomach needs to be highly acidic. It's really important that it's very, very, very acidic. Now, if you're constantly sipping water, then you're going to be alkalining your stomach. So you're going to be alkalining the very thing that needs to be acidic to be able to digest that protein. Now, that's the other reason why we don't like people drinking water um, before they eat, whilst they eat, or just after they eat. Because that water is going to flush away your beautiful stomach acid and it's going to flush away all of that digestive capability. So I know that seems very strange to not drink water when you eat, but it is very, very important. But on the flip side, having some water with some apple cider vinegar in it is going to support creating that stomach acid in your stomach. And it's going to not flush away the stomach acid and it will support digestion. So that's something that you can do. And you know, you don't want to be having huge amounts of water because it will cause distension. Um, it's harder for your bowel to hydrate with so much water going on if there's not enough fiber down there to do it. So we do want to be sipping and we never want to get thirsty. That's a really important thing because once we're thirsty, we're dehydrated. So we want to get to the point that we're constantly hydrated and we're not getting into that situation of being dehydrated. So, so small sips, you know, around 250 mils and um, you know, making sure that there's not this massive like chugging down of um, your water. Okay, now sesame seed challenge. I'm allergic to sesame seeds. Is there something else I can discover my transit time with? So yes, absolutely. The best one is um, beet kvass or beetroot juice. 
So beet kvass is a fermented beetroot um, juice, which is such a wonderful thing to have. It helps to oxygenate our blood. It supports our liver function. I could do a whole live on how awesome beet kvass is. But anyway, it, it will go through your body like the sesame seeds and will show you a transit time because, of course, you'll get that red color in your stool when it comes out. Like, you know, when you've eaten beetroot and you think, oh, my gosh, what's happened? I'm bleeding from my bowel or something. So use the beet kvass or at least eat some beetroot or have some beetroot juice. Um, you can also use four charcoal capsules and that will obviously turn your stools really dark so that really really dark black color and that will show it as well okay so kylie you're all good there answering all the questions as we get through there beautiful Alrighty. so now let's go on to transit time so jenny's talking here about transit time and it was two and a half hours on the sesame seed challenge so jenny i'm so glad that you've written that in because of course um, that's way too quick, way, way too quick. So transit time is just such a cool thing to know about your body. And the ideal transit time, as Lainey talked about, is 12 to 24 hours. And so if your transit time is too fast, then it's telling us that your gut is highly inflamed and it's trying to eliminate, is trying to get stuff out. It's inflamed, it can't cope, it just wants to get stuff out and it needs a rest. So, and this will normally happen because of an overgrowth of some form of pathogen. So whether it be a bacterial overgrowth, parasites, whether you know it's a fungal overgrowth. So some of them that you can have a viral infection in the gut, clostridium or staph. It can be um, candida, parasites, a strong history of antibiotic use and also food allergies is another big one. Um, poor bile function and carbohydrate malabsorption. So there's a lot of reasons behind that two and a half hour transit time and Jenny, you'd absolutely want to investigate that. Because what makes me so sad about reading that is that um, you're probably not assimilating all the nutrients from the food that you're eating because it's, it's too quick. It, your body, your digestive system doesn't have enough time to do all the things that it needs to do so you can get all those vital nutrients and minerals. So um, you absolutely want to look at removing inflammatory foods. So at least the big gums like gluten, dairy, lots of sugar, grains would be a big one for that and um, processed foods, those sorts of things. You wanna get a test, you really wanna see what's going on there. And you wanna look at things like your stomach acid, you wanna look at overgrowth, and you wanna look at your diet. So just a few things there, Jenny, but yes, absolutely worth investigating if that's what's going on. Okay, um, alrighty, let's get on to the microbiome. Um, I hope you guys are all still with me on all the questions. Okay, so Joanne's got a great question here. Unfortunately, I don't have acomancia and neither do my kids. Uh, you can only pass on your microbes you already have. So love to know if there are any studies coming out about the evidence that acomancia wipe out gnomes. If, um, if there are any studies coming out as evidence that antibiotics wipe out known species. So yes, we absolutely know that antibiotics, if, the, if we have broad spectrum antibiotics, if we have a constant use of antibiotics, or if the microbial community or diversity in our gut wasn't very robust, and then we have antibiotics on top of that, that can be kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back. And it can, you can cause an extinction, so a wiping out of certain species, which is really disappointing. So you can certainly do a lot of work, which it sounds like, um, you know, you have Joanne here. So you've been doing, you know, prebiotics, polyphenol rich diet. Um, you've been really, you know, doing the lactulose. You've been doing lots to help your gut but it's still showing no acomancia. 
So, um, and it's taken you so long to get your blood sugar under control with diet, which is fantastic. So, yes, you might have an extinction to acomancia, but we know now through um, all of our beautiful work that we do with Microba and working so closely with them, we know that there can be extinction of certain microbes, but then that doesn't mean that you there aren't other microbes in there that we don't know about that are performing the same function. So, um, you know, we don't want to just wholeheartedly, okay, I've got no acomancia, then, you know, I'm destined for diabetes or I've got no acomancia, so I'm never going to control my blood sugar. You may have another strain in there that's doing exactly what it needs to do and it's actually taken over that space so it's very hard for acomancia to grow back in there but it's doing what it needs to and we haven't identified that species yet when we look at those microbial reports. So in this situation, if you have an extinction of a species but you feel awesome, your blood sugar is under control, you're sleeping well, you're eliminating well, your stools are rocking, all those sorts of things, then it could well be that you've got another whole diversity in there that we don't know about, but they're doing exactly what they need to do. So that's very important. Lisa's got a great question here that um, under guide, Pracky guidance, which is very important for this one, um, she's been using partially hydrogenized guar gum. And um, she said, you know, we haven't mentioned it much in the live and in the Facebook group. And that's true. So partially hydrogenized guar gum, so PHGG, there's some awesome research coming out about how it is just food for our bugs. It's an incredible food for our beautiful gut bugs. And it can really support um, playing that prebiotic role in helping us. So um, now Lisa, absolutely, but you really want to be doing that one under the guidance of your practitioner. And certainly our cultural wellness practitioners use PHGG uh, because if you've still got this dysbiosis, if you've still got an overgrowth of a pathogen, if there's still inflammation in the gut, then the PHGG is just gonna cause more problems. So yes, it's wonderful, but it's not a free for all of just going out and grabbing one and seeing how you go. Okay, so Sarah, um, I just had a tooth pulled and now on antibiotics. Ah, Sarah, did, I hope it didn't hurt too much. After all the good work, work I have done feeding my gut flora, am, am I back to square one? So no, not at all, Sarah. We do know that um, antibiotics do knock around our gut microbiome. It's absolutely the way it is. It certainly knocks it around. But whilst you're on your um, antibiotics, if you keep up with your fermented foods, like the culture wellness yogurt, culture wellness kiffer, sauerkraut, our diversity dough, if you're keeping up all of that, and um, whilst you're on the antibiotics, you're also doing your prebiotic foods and your fibers, then you'll be able to keep the balance at play. And then once you stop the antibiotics, I would go in with things like slippery elm to soothe it up. Once again, some aloe vera, for example, and those prebiotic rich foods, and really just make sure you stay away from processed foods, sugar, carbohydrates, like keep the diet super, super clean, sleep really well, get lots of sunshine, get out in nature, and continue that for months after you've taken the antibiotics. Certainly don't drink all those sorts of things, and then your body will recover. What we're seeing is this constant use of antibiotics in conjunction with a really poor diet, bad sleep, not you know looking after ourselves, um, and foods that just feed the the pathogens, and it's just it's just a horrible sort of you know storm, a disaster there. So, but it, there you can come back from it, Sarah. There's a lot you can do. If you're unsure, Sarah, absolutely get in touch, um, and we can help you with a treatment plan of how to recover beautifully from antibiotics. Oh, Sarah, you're on there. Awesome. Well, there you go. So don't lose heart, it'll be fine. Okay, Stacey, are you able to provide in any information around acne in relation to causing, preventing, and eliminating it? Holy smokes, I could do a whole, <laughs> a whole other live on that. 
Um, so, oh, wow. Just before my wedding, my oh, I just had the most horrific acne. It was so horrible. Just scars and all sorts. So, obviously, you know, we know that acne comes from our liver that is really struggling to be able to process our hormones. We know that it comes from gut dysbiosis, which is a big problem. And we also know that it comes from diet. So the treatment should always be that inside out approach. So there's no point in putting anything on the acne because the problem is from within. So, uh, you know, if we were treating um, Stacey, either yourself or kids or whoever has the acne problem, we would first look at liver function and supporting that liver function. Then we would look at, is there a reason why the liver's under stress? And then we would look at, is there any gut dysbiosis? So why is the gut inflamed, causing liver problems? And why can't the body eliminate all of those hormones in um, and you know making sure that it leaves the body instead of this huge buildup of problems? Also, you know, when we have rashes, acne, um, all of those pro kinds of issues, it's the body giving us a sign that the load, the toxic load is too high and the body is just trying to push it out however it can. So sweating is so important for acne. It's really important. So either through exercise, just, I don't know, living in Queensland in January will do, will do it. But, um, you know, so infrared saunas is great. Now, obviously, the infrared... The beautiful light therapy is going to do so much for the acne, but the infrared itself is going to heat the body from the inside out and help us to sweat. Coffee enemas are absolute game changer when it comes to acne issues. And then, yeah, supporting the liver to eliminate, 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 eliminate to get rid of all of these things. Okay. Also, okay, so here we are. Now, a question on, um, Vinny has a question on stock and gelatin. Can you add gelatin to soups or does it make it go jelly-like? So you can actually add collagen. So gelatin will, is what we use for making gummies and for thickening up beautiful puddings or um, you know making things nice and thick and beautiful. But if you add collagen, it won't thicken it, but it will give all the properties of that beautiful gelatin. So you can add collagen instead. And if I don't have homemade stock, is Nutra Organics broth powder a good alternative? Um, so obviously you want to try and make your own if possible. Um, I do love the Broth of Life one that we have on our website. I, I know that the bones are grass-fed, they're organic, they're, the dehydrating process they use it doesn't use any chemicals. So I really, really like that company um, because I, I know it's not highly processed. So that would be something that you would absolutely want to choose. Okay, so holy smokes, I did it. I got through all of those questions. That is so rare for me. Kylie will absolutely attest to this. She's our programs manager. Kylie's on here at the moment. Um, I go off on random tangents when it comes to lives. I do a lot of lives in a week because I love chatting with our community so much and giving information. But I go on random tangents and um, always have to jump back on again to answer more questions. But Kylie, I did it. I finished all the questions, which I'm really stoked about. So we've still got um, about 12 minutes together and 12 minutes before I have to race off and pick up Noah from school. So I'm going to jump back through here and have a look at some of the questions that you guys have been posting. Um, Carolyn, does fermenting destroy vitamin C? Absolutely not. In fact, it's the opposite. It enhances it. Okay. Ah, oh, Annette, what a great question. What if you don't have a gallbladder? Will this have an impact on color? Yes, it will. Um, I think my color is generally okay, but I don't have a gallbladder. So, Annette, great question because we really encourage our community to eat a, you know, a robust amount of good quality fats. It's so important for our bodies. But, of course, our gallbladder has a huge part to play in the assimilation of those fats, the emulsification of those fats. So, when we work with our clients that have had their gallbladders removed, we actually encourage them to have um, ox bile which is a supplement that you can take that supports your, bar, your body 
um, to be able to have that, uh, you know, process of making bile to support getting that digestion happening and obviously emulsify those fats. So if you have had your gallbladder out, I would highly, highly recommend that you use Oxfile. So Kylie might put up a link, or if she can put up a link to um, a iHerb, which is a company that we use. We don't have any association or any affiliates or anything with them. We just use them because we like them and it's good quality and it's cost effective. And they have Oxfile on, um, on, on the iHerb. So I would highly recommend that. But if, um, yeah, it will change the color. It will change your digestion. Uh, my mum has had her gallbladder out and pretty much every time she eats now, she just has um, her Oxbile tablet and it's really supportive of her digestive system. Okay. Okay, Belle, um, any question to do with kids? And I'm just so excited to answer it. Okay, um, question on my toddler. Sometimes my 18 month old toddlers poos smell really um, acid almost chemical or bleach like but the form and color are normal looking occasionally it might be a little too firm he's still breastfed before sleeps but otherwise has a fairly good diet could this be directly linked to a specific food type or more of an imbalance in his gut that is such a great question. So your stools, you certainly don't want them smelling like ammonia. You don't want um, like an acid or a wee smell, um, a burning smell, chemical smell, anything like that. And, you know, I've, I've certainly found that mothers always know when something's amiss and always know that I've got to go and investigate. I've got to look at this. So if you are concerned about that, absolutely investigate. But it shouldn't have that kind of smell to it. It should, um, you know, have a poo smell, really. So I, I would investigate. Chemi chemical bleach, that kind of thing, I would be looking at is your beautiful little toddler um, having any milk or juices or anything in a plastic cup? Um, are they eating foods out of like plastic squeezy bottles? What's their exposure to chemicals and toxins? And unfortunately, in today's environment, our toddlers and our kids, their exposure to these sorts of things is just through the roof. So if, you know, um, your toddler's going on to, you know, almost being 100%, um, you know, solids and starting to explore food and eating more family food, make sure you're looking at chemical exposure um, is things in tins those sorts of things because um, the the body's probably not eliminating the chemicals very well okay so kath if you can't handle too much fiber then chia seeds is out for now okay lots of victorian crew i'm thinking of you so much trish metro melbourne Holy smokes. I lived in Melbourne for almost four years. I did my PhD there. And um, I can imagine that it's a really hard city to live in in the middle of winter when there's all this stuff going down. I can only imagine. Okay. Um, yes, Claire, absolutely. You can freeze the diversity dough breads once you've made them. Um, I actually make them the little mini ones a lot. I, I make a lot of diversity dough, but... Lots of little mini ones, and I'm always freezing them and pulling them out for school lunches and things, which is awesome. Uh, now, Kylie, that's a great question. What happens if you have urgency to go to the toilet to empty your bowels? Might come suddenly and need to empty bowels quickly and slightly on the softer side. So once again, if there's urgency and you can't hold it, and we often see this like that kind of... You wake up, you walk around the house for five, 10 minutes, and then, holy, oh, I've got to go, I've got to go. I would be investigating that. You don't want to have urgency. So um, yeah, it just shows us that there's some inflammation there, and we need to look into that further. Okay, that's a cool idea, Kath, the milk crate as your squatty potty. Love it. My husband built some crazy thing. <laughs> Uh, oh, thanks, Rhonda. You jumped in there and answered for us. Um, okay. Now, great question, Sally. Can kids, kids go on a parasite cleanse? If so, have you had any success with fussy eaters being able to do it? 
Okay, Sally, this is this is our sweet spot, and it's my personal <laughs> sweet spot, coming from a mum who had very well, like well, Noah basically just ate white food, and that was it. It was um, white rice cakes, pretty much. I myself was down to two foods, so zucchini and lamb, when I was at my worst, and. Um, so we, amongst the team, we actually added up the other day, getting ready for our case study series, we added up the amount of years experience that we have amongst our whole team. And I was so um, so excited and also so shocked, we're like, wow, we've got so much experience and lots of experience when it comes to fussy eating. And what we find is that the fussy eating comes from the parasite issues. It comes from the imbalance. So once we get the kids on the herbs and once we get them on the appropriate diet, we, we it's not like a vanishing act and it's not magic, but we really do see the fussy eating just, um, you know, fizzle away. So especially we work with a lot of kids with sensory issues, developmental needs, lots and lots of issues that, um, you know, technically could cause them to not be able to swap over to a whole foods diet. But you know, I've got a beautiful boy at the moment that I'm working with and he's completely non-verbal and only ate white food. And once getting him on a culture wellness diet and starting on the herbs, he's having Brussels sprouts and broccoli and cauliflower and liver pate and fermented foods. And it's so cool to watch. When you stop the inflammation and you stop feeding the pathogens, it's, it's just so cool to see what happens. So Sally, absolutely you can. And kids can go on a parasite cleanse, um, uh, definitely not under the age of, of two. After two, um, to about five, then obviously we need, to, it's a case by case basis, but after five, obviously under supervision with our um, beautiful practitioners, then yes, we can do parasite cleanses. And you know, I, I really, really wholeheartedly am very passionate about the fact that all kids at least once a year should do a parasite cleanse as a maintenance anyway okay oh cool laney i don't i don't know that company with the chicken bone broth powder but if they've um gone through your um amazing um process then they will be they will be really good okay um kath if we are drinking unfiltered tap water is that bad um I don't know how to say this politely, but yes, it's really bad. So tap water has a whole truckload of chlorine in it. And chlorine is there to kill off bacteria and kill off anything in the water that may harm us. But remembering that we are 80%, if not more, made up of bacteria, fungi, viruses. We're, we're made up of a microbial community. We're only about 10% DNA. And we're mostly made up of bacteria, this beautiful ecosystem. And so if we're drinking tap water that has chlorine in it, um, that's going to literally be killing us off. There's no other kind of <laughs> nice way of putting it. So you, we've got to watch our water. It, it's absolutely um, an, an absolute must to the point that when Kylie travels or where I, when I travel, I, um, Kylie travels with her Brita jug. Um, and as soon as we get somewhere together, you know, or if we're, traveling somewhere you take your jug make sure it's filtered i have a little bottle that i'll fill up the bottle and it's got a carbon filter in the top that i'll squeeze out of um and then you know i've got other filters that i will take for longer periods of time and you know when we've got you know in our house we've got filters on our drinking water we've got filters on our showering water and we've got filters on our bar water where we have our baths because the last thing you want is to have a beautiful bath with Epsom salt. It's nice and warm. All your pores open up and then all the chlorine just goes straight in there. So you don't want to have that. Uh, alrighty. Um, okay. So Kylie's answering lots of questions there. There's the Zazan, which is fantastic. We've got the Akamansia. Alrighty. Yes, it was Broth of Life, Kath. I think we're getting through them all. Die! hello. Oh, I'm glad you love a good tangent, Di, because I sure can fire one up. 
Um, okay, so I think we've got everyone, and I have run out of time, but I have a few, um, before I jump off and go and pick up Noah, I've got a few things to say before I go. So firstly, thank you so much for having me, and thank you, Lainey, once again for, um, you know, doing this beautiful Fiverr challenge, and it's just been so wonderful. I've loved and especially Kylie and all the cultural wellness team, we really loved seeing everyone just wanting a thirst for knowledge about the gut microbiome and about fiber and prebiotic foods and how to support yourself in a whole foods way. So it's just, it's really cool for me to see. It's very heartwarming to see how exciting, um, you know, the excitement that people have for how they can look after themselves. So thank you, Lainey, and thank you everyone for being here. Now, we obviously, Culture Wellness had that fiber bundle, um, and so make sure you make the most of it because it's an absolutely massive discount. So it enables you to make your diversity dough, so it's a, like a sourdough with all those prebiotic fibers. You've got your diversity dough in there, you've got your um, Culture Wellness premix with all the fibers in there, which the Whole Food Collective actually supports us to put all of those together. Um, so it's a wonderful connection that we have. And then you get that ebook, and um, we've also thrown in a kiffer for free, so you can make your own culture wellness kiffer. So it's only seventy nine dollars. So please grab it. Um, it ends on the ninth. The offer ends on the ninth of September, and it's a huge saving. So jump on and grab it and get started with your making your diversity dough. And also, um, for those of you, because there's been some questions in here about parasite cleansers, programs, testing, those sorts of things, which is a, um, you know, a really big part of cultured wellness and obviously our virtual clinic that we have. If you are interested in that, then we do have a, um, like an information session on Wednesday night. So Kylie, who is on this call, you would have seen her popping up here, there and everywhere. Kylie's our programs manager. She is a registered nurse and is a GAPS practitioner, an integrative health coach. She's just everything. And we will be doing a live together talking about how, how do we help our clients to get across the line? What testing do we do? You know, if they had these symptoms, um, what cleanses would we do? How long would it take for them to get better? What would their diet look like? Um, all those sorts of things. How do we work with them? So if you've got any questions about the nuts and bolts of um, where to from here, um, make sure that you join the live. I'm sure Kylie will put up a link to register for the live. It's all online. Um, and then we can go through all those details for you because we want to support you to make sure that you're continuing on with your journey. Um, beautiful. I think that's everything. But once again, thank you so much. I really just thoroughly enjoy answering questions, talking about all things the gut microbiome and fiber. And um, now, obviously, make sure that you jump on over to the Whole Food Collective Facebook page to continue all the awesome information and all the benefits from the Whole Food Collective. But also, when this uh, page ends, we can also nurture you over in the Cultured Wellness Community page. So that's where we have a lot of how do I ferment, what happened to my diversity dough, how do I cook it. Um, lots of questions about fermenting. So you've got two beautiful communities, the Whole Food Collective and Culture Wellness, that um, you know, if you want more support and if you want to be in a like-minded place, just make take the advantage of those communities. Lainey spends a lot of time and a lot of resources and a lot of love and care in her community and, and we're the same. We have our practitioners and our clinicians 24 um, hours, seven days a week in our community groups, making sure that everyone has everything that they need so they can get back to vitality and wellness again. So um, just make sure that you make the most of it because it's a really um, something that we're both really proud of and we want to we want people to use it and take advantage of it because it's there. Alrighty, so um, if you have more questions, Sing out, shoot them back to Lainey or to myself, and we may need to do another live. There's so much to go through and lots of beautiful um, information out there. But thank you once again for having me. It's been so wonderful to connect with you all. And I'll catch you. 
either in the programs live on Wednesday or I will catch you in a live in the community group or I'm sure Lainey and I will join forces again sometime soon. So all the best, everyone, and have a wonderful afternoon. See ya.